The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good morning, everybody. This is Adrian Jensen with Predictive Engineering and Applied CAX. Thank you for coming to our seminar. Uh, also on the line, we have Brian Cole. Hello. And George Laird. Hello. Good morning. And uh, if you guys haven't done one of these seminars in the past, the way this works is one of us will be presenting. The other, uh, the other engineers on the line will be keeping an eye out for questions, and we might pass back and forth the uh, the presentation. But in the go to webinar little dashboard that pops up, you'll see a section for questions. So you can type in your questions there, and somebody might be answering those on the fly. We might address them live during during the presentation, or maybe we don't get to them and we can follow up with you afterwards. But we appreciate all the questions. Before we get too far into this, I want to introduce another one of our team members. We have Andy Whitesides, and he's our account manager. Andy, are you on the line? I am. Thanks, Adrian. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for this seminar. Just wanted to uh, introduce Applied CAX. We're an organ-based partnership of uh, two engineering companies. Uh, Predictive Engineering has been doing FEA work and CFD work for 20 years. Sherpa Design uh, is a mechanical design firm with a precision machine shop. They've been uh, using these tools for 15 to 18 years. And Applied CAX, we've been around for 10 years now, helping some of the biggest names in the industry. Really, our goal is to develop a community of knowledge um, that spans a spectrum from CAD to CAE to PDM to all the other acronyms out there that that you can't possibly know on your own, just to be a resource for, for your company and, and your teams. Um, I know some, some of you do this every day, like us. Some of you, it's more project driven and, and you do it uh, you know, a couple times a month, a couple times a quarter. Uh, we like to be a resource to, to teams of, you know, of all flavors to just not get stuck, to uh, um, you know, really help our clients when they when they run into troubles with models um you've got adrian you've got brian you've got george instead of uh instead of submitting a support ticket and an 800 number um you're talking to the the same guys um day in and day out guys that are using these tools every day and with that um if you have any questions let's see about uh about licensing um communication in general these guys are, are Pretty de dedicated to uh, to the work that they're doing and, and to the technical uh, support for our customers. Anything in terms of licensing and capabilities, I'm your guy for that. Um, we've got some trainings on the calendar. We've got uh, we try and do FEMAP trainings twice a year. Our next one is coming up in October. And typically we've done an LS Dyna training once a year, but we've had enough demand for that that we're looking at doing that twice a year also. Potentially the next one in November. And then we've got some uh, on-demand online materials as well. If, if uh, you're starting to get into FEMAP APIs, we've got a, an API course that you can reach out to us about that's an on-demand online course. And uh, yeah, with that, if you've got any questions, definitely don't hesitate to reach out to me. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. Right on. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so as I as I mentioned, we have Brian Kolb and George Laird on the line. Brian's going to be helping me out today. George, you want to do a a quick little intro while we have you? Uh, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, Andy covered it, man. Yeah. Uh, we, all I can say, guys, is that we this is not marketing. We we want to keep it hardcore technical, and you've got it all. And so let's let's get going. Cool. Let's get into it. All right, so the, the main focus for this one is solid modeling. I wanted to go back to a bit of an introduction. And uh, because sometimes the easiest stuff, just solid modeling, put a mesh on it, get it to run, isn't so easy. So I want to go through the, the basic analysis workflow, steps from geometry through materials, properties, meshing, putting on boundary conditions, and analyzing. And I want to do that so we can see little hangups, little snags along the way. Muted. It's going to be very useful to see. All right, this is an easy workflow, but where do we run into problems? Our outline here 
Now this presentation, both the recording, the paper and the models will be available online for you later on. We're gonna work through each of these and we're sprinkling in some more advanced uh, useful tips and tricks along the way. So maybe you're a new user, you can focus on the, the, the upper level topics that we're focus, focusing on, or maybe you've been using FEMAP for quite a while and some of these tips and tricks or new features will be helpful for you guys. So we've got a large transmission housing here that we'll be working through today. It might look familiar from the uh, FEMAP splash screen here. And uh, before we actually start doing our modeling, I always like to do a bit of an introduction with the FEMAP preferences. So let's open up FEMAP here. Whenever anyone's having problems or doing a new install or a new user, this is generally where I start, is under File and Preferences, not to be confused with References. There's lots of different things to adjust here, but we took a few of the most important ones, put them into our paper here. Undo, it's a great thing to be able to control Z, undo if you make a mistake in your model. You can set your number of undo levels in preferences here. So you've got this sort of temporary files keeping track of what you've done. You can undo and redo. It's really nice if you wanna try something, you're not sure it's gonna work, you can always do it. If it doesn't work, you can undo it. Screen resolution. You want these nice sharp images for your engineering report. In the views section of preferences, you go to resolution and you can actually adjust how large your images are gonna be. So if we take a look at preferences, views, you've got your screen resolution. So you can scale it up by some huge factor, get massive high res images. You could have some sort of fixed size. You always want the same aspect ratio for your report. You've got control over all of that in your model here. And then some picking options, uh, whether you want to pick front or pick normal, uh, how you're gonna be zooming and rotating around the model. You can choose all those options here. So we'll go ahead and explore some of these, see exactly what they do. One of the uh, options they've added more recently is the, the dynamic zoom and rotate. Rather than having some floating point in space, you've now got this ability where you can actually zoom and rotate around your cursor. So once we pull hey, up a model. Yes? Yeah, hey Adrian, I, um, on D12, did they clean this up? The pick thing. The pick thing, whether it's yeah, pick normal or out. pick front. Yeah, then, and, and the dynamic, did they change that under V12? I don't remember hearing about any changes to that. Okay, yeah. that's my bitch. <laughs> I, find this, I find this whole system clunky. Yeah. And uh, I, would, I would advise our, our colleagues out there using FEMAP with it for a while. If you find it clunky, send us an email and I can pass it on and as formally um because we use other we use other programs not 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 fea pre post but other type programs it doesn't seem to be so complicated by getting the mouse to rotate so okay i'll go back yeah to you. this is this is one of the new settings that i like though this seems to be seems to be pretty helpful here okay so you check both mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right, so let's take a quick look at the settings live. You've got all these various tabs here. Like I said, views is where you can control your resolution. Uh, we'll be talking about view settings. You can modify all of your view settings. And once you get them set the way you want, you save them. And you can start, have a startup view. So you can always start a fresh model with your specific view settings rather than default settings. User interface, this is where we see our, our pick method, pick normal, pick front, our rotation methods, and so on. Now, one that I don't have in my, my little presentation there, but I want to focus on or bring up is uh, some of our database control. Where are all these temporary files that allow you to undo and redo? We want to make sure that we actually know where all this stuff is going, and we're going to direct all of that to the scratch folder. This is something that FEMAP will prompt you to create when you install the program. So this page here is really focusing on the temporary files that FEMAP creates, whereas if we go to interfaces, this is all the temporary files that Nastran creates. And so we're just using option two. We're gonna direct everything to one spot. We want it on a local drive, not over the network. And you want that on your fastest drive. So if you've got a solid state drive, with lots of space, that's the best way to go to help 
things move quickly. Okay, let's bring in some geometry. So I'm gonna keep coming back to our, our general workflow here. Geometry, materials and properties, meshing, boundary conditions, and then we analyzed. As you get more advanced with your, your FEA skills, you can bounce around a bit more, but it's really best to stick to this specific workflow until you really have a good handle on things. Even once you're an expert, your life's gonna be easier if you stick to this. So geometry, we're gonna be importing a CAD file, CAD geometry, and this is the little pop-up you'll see when you bring in geometry. There's always gonna be a scale factor. Now, FEMAP is unit agnostic, so you'll want to pay attention to what sort of dimensional sizes you've got, and you can control your scale factor here when you bring those parts in. So I've got a new model file. I'm gonna say file, import geometry, and I've got a little assembly here to work with. And here's the scale factor. So the geometry is stored in meters. This is gonna convert to inches. Uh, if you wanted to work in millimeters, you could use a scale factor of a thousand here. And there's other options on how you might color your, your model. This one here is gonna come in with um, colors saved from the, the part file or the geometry file. So you can see things are transparent here. You can see some of the internals. If you wanna modify any of those colors, you have control over all of the, all of the colors, whether you wanna change individual surfaces, solids and so on. You can also change the transparency. So we'll go ahead and now that we've seen some of the internals that we're working with, we'll reset that transparency. Now this is a rather complex assembly. If the, in the full blown project here, we'd be using contact, bolt preload, but we just wanna focus on one part. So how do we navigate through all these different parts in the model? There's different ways to let me back up here. <clears throat> there's different ways to blank and hide individual parts. And there's some newer tools that really make this quite fancy, especially with the mesh already on the model. But just a little introduction here is from the model info tree. This is where all your new entities are gonna be populated and you get quick access. Under geometry, you can see the individual solids that we have here. And we can turn these off one at a time. We can also right click on those and say show selected only and isolate some parts. Now the other parts are not suppressed or removed or anything, they're simply just not displayed. So this is really the best starting point for controlling the type of entities you're gonna display in your models. Just go to the model info tree and use your little check boxes. You can imagine as you get more and more complicated models with hundreds of solids and properties, doing individual checkboxes can be a little bit slow. So you might want to move over to the visibility toolbox. You can see control Q. You wanna remember that uh, shortcut, it'll save you some time. You'll see all the same options that you get in the model info tree. They'll give you some buttons here to help out. Make things a little bit quicker, so maybe we only wanna do this or we want to reverse that selection, only blanking that solid, they give you some more advanced tools. And then they give you some more granularity, allowing you to turn off individual entities like surfaces or curves and so on. So this is step one or level one. This is level two. And it's going to be unmuted for you. That control, control Q shortcut, getting used to using that on the regular. All right, now our first step, Brian, I'm going to keep you muted just because I get a lot of background. Oh, I'm muted. I'm muted. Right, hold on just one sec. So the first step for geometry or for our analysis workflow is thinking about any sort of geometry preparation that we're going to do. Do we want to slice this into multiple pieces? Do we want to remove features? Do we want to split our surfaces to allow for different types of boundary condition applications? Maybe we want to apply a load or constraint, not to an entire surface, but a subsection of that surface. We're gonna to wanna to make any of these modifications to the geometry early on. 
before we have a mesh, before we've applied our loads. You can update those later on, but if you do it now, it's gonna, it's gonna be a smoother overall workflow. So let's do a quick look at some of the different options we have here with, with geometry. <clears throat> the three that I show in the paper there, we've got geometry, solid slice. Now this is the best way for subdividing a piece of geometry into multiple solids. Maybe we want different mesh sizes on different regions or different materials on different parts. The other one is this little toolbar called curves on surfaces. This isn't really gonna break our solid into more solids, but it's gonna allow us to add or control uh, surface split lines in our geometry. All geometry is really gonna start out with certain split lines or inscribed curves on the surfaces. And this allows us to add more or control more. And then the final one I show on here is the meshing toolbox. Now we have entire seminars dedicated to the meshing toolbox. So I'm not gonna get too much into that at this point. We'll play with it a little bit, but there's lots of options there. And that really comes in handy for the, the feature removal, whether you wanna get rid of specific curves or holes, fillets, this tool is really nice for that. And in the, the new version, V12, which should be out uh, sometime this summer, they've done some reworked to the uh, the architecture of the code, which is speeding things up quite a bit. They had an example model where originally they're removing tons of holes from this complex piece of geometry. It took about a minute for it to run. And with the new build, it's down to about a second. So there's a huge reduction in the amount of time it takes to do these feature removals in V12 when that comes out. So let's take a quick look here. <clears throat> now, if I wanted to split a surface here, not necessarily subdivide my geometry into different parts, but just split a surface, I could use curves on surfaces, do something like point to edge, where I have a starting point and a target edge, and it will then imprint a curve onto that surface. So I now have two surfaces, I don't have any more solids here. And this allows me a little bit more control, like I said, for boundary conditions or possibly for mesh control as well. There's certain features in here that, well, what exactly is the mesh gonna do in this region here? Maybe I wanna split this so I have some more control later on. Now you can click your entities and click okay. You can also double click to make things a little bit faster. So I could double click here and double click here. And it basically hits that OK button for you automatically. So that's curves on surfaces. Park that back up here. Now let's talk about slice. This is probably one of the most common geometry tools I use for solids, slice. You've got a lot of different options here. You can do a slice, which will actually break your geometry into multiple solids, or you can just do a cross section, which will basically generate a new surface, telling you what that particular section cut would look like. And then for methods, there's more methods to choose from. You can either do a plane, you could choose along a face, pick an existing face in your model with a sheet solid, which is a 2D. Uh, 2D solid with no volume to it, or with a curve. Now slicing with a plane, that's pretty straightforward. I'll grab this guy and we'll slice it with a global plane. And I'll just pick some random spot in the model here. Let's snap to this point and I slice through. And you can see it now generates a new solid in the tree. Now that's not exactly what I want to do for this model, so I'm going to use our ability to undo, control Z, and it undoes that slice. I want to do something a little bit uh, more entertaining for this one. I'm going, to, I'm going to pretend that we want to focus on this area. Maybe that's our high stress region or our area of concern, and I want to break out this section right here into a, a separate solid. So I'm going to slice that not with a plane, but with a curve. 
So I need to create that curve. I'm going to use a circle. And it's going to be located at the origin. And we're going to try a radius of two and a half inches. So you can see we've drawn this curve in space. It's actually sitting on our work plane. VMAP always has this floating 2D work plane where you can draw curves and you can modify this if you want. But this is going to be my cutting tool. This is like my cookie cutter here. So I'll use that same command, solid slice, but this time I'm going to be cutting with a curve. So let's choose our solid that we want to slice and then the curve that we're going to slice with our circle here. You can see there's a little highlighter, so you can confirm that you've picked the right entity. And then a direction to slice, which way are we going to actually push our cookie cutter? And I'll use the global Z direction. So if we take a look, we now have a separate body here. And this will allow us a little bit more control down the line. <clears throat> All right, so let's do, in the uh, name of view settings, let's talk about some of these, these view options that we can work with here. Here's an example of three totally different view settings on a model, exact same model. Nothing is different between these three models. It's purely changes in view settings. So you'll notice when, I, when my model popped up, I started in a, in a view that looked like this. This is the default FEMAP view setting. So a fresh install, if you've never mod any, modified anything, this is what it would look like. Let's play around with this. So maybe I want all of my surfaces to be a specific color or my background to be a specific color. I can modify that. Let's modify our background color. And let's say maybe we don't like this blue. We want to do some sort of green. Now, once you've got your views set the way you want, obviously there's a lot more options than just background color, is you can save this view setting. And we're going to do that through our visibility toolbox. So Control Q brings this up here. Not only can I choose how the view is set up with certain entities turned on or off, I can then save this view. And really the best thing to do before you start saving views is give them a title. You can see this view here. We've got predictive engineering pre-processing. Let's manage that and we'll give it a new title. Let's say solid modeling workflow. All right, so this particular view has a specific unique title. And when we save this view to our view library, we can then access it for other models. Or if we mess something up in here, we change our background color to, to something that we don't want. And we turn off some entity that we want to turn back on. We can almost use this as a bit of a recovery. So we activate these saved views from visibility. Rather than save, we say load. You can see some previous view settings that I've saved here and then this solid modeling workflow that we just saved. And it's going to bring all of those view settings back to you. So I'd mentioned early on that you can have one of your own custom view settings as the default, the new default, and that's done from preferences. So we'd go into views and you can pick something from your view library. So every new model that you create will automatically use your custom view settings. <clears throat> okay, we're going to take a look at materials and properties, and then uh, we'll play around with some other features. I'll pass it over to Brian after this, and we can explore a bit more. All right, so materials and properties. You can create these from the file menu, also from the model info tree. We have uh, 
seminars based on different types of workflows. So whatever you're comfortable with, I generally recommend starting out with the uh, the file menus to get a get a handle on how FEMAP is organized. So we're going to create a material. You can create your own material from scratch, punching in the elastic content constants here, or you can load from the FEMAP libraries. Just like you'd be loading a view setting, you can load materials. And once you modify or create your own materials, you can save them as well. So FEMAP is always using these libraries to give you places to store or access this information. Now, although FEMAP is unit agnostic or unitless, they do have different material libraries with different unit systems. So you can see millimeter, newton, ton, SI, or this default one in inch pound seconds. So I'll load up that material here. And if you're like me and a bit um, focused on organization, a lot of times I'll go into my material and really remove everything that I know I'm not explicitly going to be using. So I'm just looking at modulus, Poisson's ratio, and density, and I'm going to wipe out everything else. I don't need it. I don't want that cluttering up my model. Now this pops back up again because we have auto repeat turned on. So if you wanted to generate lots of materials or lots of properties, you don't want to have to go to model, material, and the file menus each time. So some people really like this setting. Some people really don't. Going back to preferences, you have the ability to turn this on and off. Auto repeat commands. So if you don't like that, you could turn it off when you create a material. So this is now material two. I click OK and it goes away. So it's not going to automatically repeat these commands. Now let's do our properties. When you first bring up the property, it's going to default to a plate property type. We're working with solids, so we want to switch this type over to solid. And solids are really pretty easy. You pick a material, you give it a name, and maybe you pick a color for it. And that's all you have to do. Now, you notice that doesn't automatically pop back up again because we turn that auto repeat option off. One of the shortcuts that's kind of nice, if you do want to repeat your same previous command, you can right click in the screen here and say previous command, and we're now generating another property. And what I learned recently is you can use control Y to do that repeat previous command. So you can turn off the automatic stuff, you can give yourself these shortcuts to save, save the time, but really give yourself more of the control. <clears throat> All right, going back to our workflow, we've done our geometry, we've done some initial preparation and cleanup, we've done materials and properties. Now it's time for a little bit more model organization, and then we'll get into our mesh sizing and our meshing. So I'm going to pass this over to Brian because we've already talked about sort of level one and level two view controls, but in FEMAP version 11.4, they introduced the draw race toolbar. That's like level three. And it takes, it took me a little while to warm up to it, uh, but now I, I really like it. I think it's an extremely useful tool. So Brian, can you... Uh, steal the presentation. Right on. Unmuted. All right, uh, I'm going to talk a little briefly about the Draw Race toolbar. Um, it's a real handy toolbar that I use constantly. Um, like he was saying earlier, as you start to get to more complex models, um, it can be a bit cumbersome to come over here to kind of work with things, especially if you get a model from somebody, perhaps, and they're named in ways that don't really uh, make sense. So what we use is this guy appears, the Draw Race toolbar. 
and it's a handy little feature. So if you got some main uh, buttons to click here with some drop down menus. The first option is uh, you can turn it on and off, uh, and I'll show why that's uh, useful later. And then you can either draw, erase, draw mode, or you can use the erase mode. And that makes sense. So draw mode shows, erase mode, erase like you would expect. And then you've got some selecting options, select solids and various other things, and also you can select elements and things. So we'll just kind of run through a few things here. Um, so as you can see, you've got, I can click solids and I can run through and highlight various solids. So let's click this guy, click OK. So as you can see, it brings it up and hides everything else, um, which is nice. We still have everything active, uh, but we can kind of come go ahead and take a look at this uh, without all the other clutter. We can also go ahead and hit this, and it'll hide it, which is a convenient little thing. Um, one nice thing is you can turn the draw race bar on and off. It'll just it'll store everything that you have, um, but it won't actually show up here, which is handy. Um, one thing you always want to make sure when you're using the draw race toolbar is to make sure that you don't leave it on or have things stored because it can really mess you up, um, you know, as you as you start to work. Um, and I'll show you why. So um, when you're working and you have something showed and you're and you want to maybe modify the geometry, say slice it. So let's come here, solid slice, and we'll just do with plane. Select this guy. We can do global plane. Let's just slice the YZ. And we will just stick it here, say. So you look, and it looks like our model has crashed, like our geometry has failed. Um, that is not actually the case. The fact is you have draw race toolbar on, and with this show, if I go ahead and turn it off, look, and everything is nice. Um, so that's what that means is if you want to actually work with the, the toolbar and, and uh, hide things, I recommend uh, you can hit this to clear everything. But I recommend hiding objects and then working with the remaining geometry. Um, and that'll allow you to slice things and it's not going to mess stuff up, uh, but if it's shown, it will. Uh, another nice feature about this is you can come over here and you've got a bunch of different ways to select various stuff, but you can actually come in and create groups, which is a real handy uh, way to grab stuff. Um, one thing to be aware, if you're, if you're selecting surfaces and you've grabbed a surface and you create a group with that, that's only going to have the surface. It's not going to have curves and points, so you'll have to add that in afterwards. But it's a really nice handy feature and a way to come in quickly and make groups of various items. Um, one nice thing is you can actually use your mesh. Uh, so I'm just kind of throwing this up here. And you can come in and you can select elements. Um, you know, you can select properties, oops, um, which is nice. So that's kind of handy. Um, and uh, another thing here, which is nice, is you can choose to auto select mesh. So when you're grabbing stuff, you can either grab just the feature or you can actually grab uh, grab things with a mesh. And uh, another really handy feature here is this grow and shrink that you can use. Um, so what that'll do is it'll actually allow you to take an element and grow it uh, and shrink it. Uh, and I've actually recently used that in a project. I had uh, some RBE2s that were connecting two structures together. And uh, I was having some issues where when I was messing with things, some of the, the RBE2 wasn't connected to the elements. And I couldn't figure out uh, it, it, which ones weren't connected. So I was able to come in here, grab the elements I wanted, click grow. And you can come in and you can say that, you know, anything that this is attached to, it's going to expand one element out. I was able to come in and make sure that all the parts were, in fact, connected. So, you know, it's a real handy way to troubleshoot uh, and, uh, and work through meshing issues. Um, but uh, all in all, it's just a really handy tool. It's, uh, it's an easy way to come in and kind of cruise through your model uh, without having to go through and do all the work in the menu over here. So I think that's about all I want to say about that. Um, I want to hand it back to Adrian. I'll let him continue. Perfect. Well, I think you can carry on because the next steps for us are are mesh sizing. Okay. So um, you can you can pick a solid, you can set a size, but really one of the important things or the interesting things to do is set different mesh sizes on different solids in your model. So we'll do a little bit of uh, talk about the multi-solid sizing. Yeah. 
And so uh, to display this uh, feature, I'm going to go ahead and just throw a mesh on this little part here. Um, so I've isolated it up here. So we've got this solid uh, part. And let's say we want to put a more refined mesh around this area. Um, and instead of just throwing a really refined mesh all over the part, uh, it'd be nice to, to do a little refinement. So to start, we'll go ahead and do geometry, solid, slice again. Um, and we're going to go ahead and use curves. So we'll come in here, select our solid. We'll select our curves. All these. Let's check to make sure we have them. Okay. Uh, and one thing about solid slice, uh, you know, earlier and what I'll use today is just doing a global, but you can actually choose, pick directions based on your model or based off of any, you, know, you can pick any vector you want um, for this particular model. We just need to go in the global Z because uh, we just want to slice it straight through. So we can come in and we can see that we have sliced our parts. So again, draw race toolbar is a nice way to come in and see that we do have separate bodies. So, okay. So now we're going to go ahead and use mesh, the mesh, uh, mesh control, and we'll do size on solid, and we'll set the size for our little cylinders here. And we'll go ahead and set that to 0.05, and then we will hit previous command, which is a nice little thing if you if you're going to be working with the same command a lot, and we can select our larger feature. And let's just set that to 0.2. So now if we go ahead and we mesh the solid, um, it's going to tell us that, this, the, that certain uh, some of the features don't have meshing attributes, and that's because we've sliced them out. Um, it's taken away from the one. So we're just going to override all of those by hitting no. In. No. Um, so also, I remember we were talking about the visibility earlier. So this toolbar up here is also sort of like a miniature version of this. Um, you can turn surfaces on and off and elements and nodes. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and take a look. So as you can see, we have a fine mesh, coarse mesh, but it does not match up. Um, so that is not what we wanted. So what we're going to want to do is we'll just go ahead and delete the mesh really quick. Okay. We want to keep our properties, turn the surfaces back on. So to fix this, what you want to do is go back into mesh, mesh control, size on solids. You want to select everything this time and click OK. And the, the most important thing here is you want to make sure to take this replace mesh size on all curves and unselect that. What we want to be doing is working in this assembly multi-solid sizing area. Uh, particularly, we want adjacent surfaces to match. So we click OK. And um, as you can see, you've got these uh, opaque surfaces. And what that's showing is that these surfaces are, in fact, linked. And you can actually see it down here in the bottom. So now we should be able to go in mesh, geometry, solids, grab all those, use our meshing attributes. We could come in here and we have a nice matched mesh. I'll turn surfaces off. So you can see, OK, great, everything lines up. Uh, one thing to be aware of, though, is that even though the meshes match and the surfaces uh, are paired, they aren't actually, uh, the nodes aren't actually uh, merged. So in order to fix this, we're going to come up to Tools, and we'll come into Check, and Check Coincident Nodes. And so if you come in here, you can highlight all these areas. Um, I usually like to try and stick to the areas that I want to check so I don't accidentally merge or any nodes that I don't uh, want. So I've grabbed those. Click OK. So you have a couple options here. You have your tolerance, safe merge. You can make groups. You can merge. You can just list things or you know have certain stuff. Um, I always like to preview to make sure that it's actually you know got the nodes that I want. So you can see it's a little cluttered because I have text on, but basically it's grabbed all the nodes in those areas, showing that they are in fact uh, li uh, not merged. Click OK. And there you go. Now you have merged nodes. You have a nice uh, mesh here that uh, becomes more coarse as we go out. And our model is connected.
So that's the uh, multi-solid sizing method. It's incredibly handy for solid uh, meshing, so that you can you know, get individual refinement in areas without having to just, you know, put a, an absurdly fine mesh over your entire structure. Um, so yeah, with that, I'll pass it back to Adrian, and we'll continue on the large model. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So that that's really useful, especially because you don't have to muted update individual curves and you say all right here's my fine mesh here's my coarse mesh step three link them together so it's pretty quick <clears throat> okay so let's get this part meshed and we'll uh see if we can run into some of the other problems that we'll see uh with our models here so let me just back up here I've got materials, properties. <clears throat> so I'm going to use that same sort of command that Brian did. Next step here is our, our mesh sizing. So we can say mesh control, size on solid. I'll grab both of these. And we'll just go with our defaults. So it's always fine to, to start out with the defaults, uh, but I recommend taking a look at the help sections we undo this let's try that again i'll say size on solid if we have this open we can hit the f1 key and it'll take us to this section of the help file and all these various commands that we're just glazing right over <laughs> they're actually there's some useful stuff in there for sure so um not everything we can cover in a in a short seminar like this but the help file is actually pretty good talking about different things that are going on Another good point that Brian brought up was taking a look at the message window down below here. This is one of the default panes in FEMAP. And if you hold the control key and roll your mouse, you can actually adjust the size of this. But you always want to have this pane turn on so you can review certain messages that are popping up here. So when I set my sizing, just like Brian's model, it tells us we have these linked surfaces from the little part that I cut out here. The other thing it's telling me is two short edges have been suppressed. So it automatically found a few little tiny slivers or short edges in my model and suppressed those. That could be a good thing. Maybe we don't wanna mesh something that small for this particular mesh size, but it's always good to know what FEMAP is doing to your model in the background. So keep an eye on your message window. All right, next step is meshing. Um, before we get into that, in our notes here, we have a quick quick little spiel about our element types. You're gonna, for your solid element types, you have the ability to use tetrahedrals, which is what we're working with today, or hex elements. Now, hex elements generally require a lot more work to get your model to actually hex mesh, but there's pros and cons for each. In a situation like this, we're trying to slap a mesh on here, get this thing up and running quickly. We might pay for it with a little extra solve time, but we can get the model running in a short amount of time. Hex elements are really good when you can put in that legwork up front, and you're gonna generate a much smaller model. Here's kind of a general ratio of node count just to do a cube. You could do a cube with eight nodes using hex elements where it takes 26 nodes for tetrahedral elements. So that's the exact same mesh size, a lot more nodes to your model. And once you get into nonlinear models or dynamic models, having this reduced file size with hex elements is nice. So you're always balancing either the time up front to prepare it for hex or the time down the road to actually run the model with tets. For the geometry we're working with, it's so complicated, we could never really hex mesh this part. It's just not worth it. So we want to move forward quickly with a tet mesh, and we'll just keep an eye on our element quality and make sure things are, are coming out nicely. So I've done my mesh sizing. Let's do mesh, geometry, solids. I'll pick both of these guys. And again, all of my default settings here. <clears throat> all right, so the message window, keep an eye on this. Meshing skipped on a degenerate surface. So there's some sort of nasty geometry, maybe a sliver or something corrupt in this geometry. 
And the overall process of tet meshing is it's going to coat the entire outer surface with 2D elements. And once that creates a sealed enclosed volume, it'll then propagate that mesh into the solid. So we start out with just an outer shell. If that passes, then it generates real solid elements. And in the message window here, you'll get some information on your element quality. So the Jacobian is a great general indicator of your element quality. High is bad. So the closer we are to zero, the better quality our elements are. I'd like to stay below 0.9 for everything in my model and really below 0.6 or so for my high stress regions or my, my areas of concern. Now I have two solids here. So this is one of the solids, maybe this little guy in here. And then I've got this guy here, which is probably the main outer solid. So I've got a couple of elements above 0.95, 11 elements above 0.9. So I'm getting some nasty elements generated by this. Now we can always, in the name of getting something done quickly, all right, let's just run it. We'll tell Nastran to ignore those bad elements, run anyways, and then come back and clean it, clean it up later on. But the more time you spend modeling, the more you're gonna get used to automatically keeping an eye on your mesh quality. And you can do that with the model data contour. This is also available under advanced post. And this tool has a lot of different options, but for us, one of the most common ones is looking at our element quality. You'd be contouring this just like you'd be contouring your stresses. So I'm gonna pick the specific element quality vector and I'm gonna turn on allow labels. And we are now contouring element quality over the model. So we all know red is bad. See a little label up here. We've got some nasty little sliver elements. And there's some tools in the meshing toolbox we could probably use to get that sorted out. Majority of it is blue and gray, low Jacobian, good element quality. There's another region down here that's got some nasty little elements. So in the sake of keeping things quick, we don't wanna spend a ton of time with our tet meshing, hand working everything into place. I'm gonna use a slightly different mesh sizing tool. And this is called geometry preparation. And it's gonna identify nasty little areas like this, and it's gonna try and fix them up automatically for us. So I'll use undo, going back to before I'd set up my, my mesh sizing. And I just can't work with that green. <laughs> so um, geometry preparation, it's the first item under the top of the, the mesh menu here. And this is gonna do two things. Let's start with our outer solid here. And I'll do it like Brian. I'll have a bigger mesh size for this one and then a smaller one for the, the little part there. So it's going to prepare geometry and set mesh sizing. So the more aggressive, the larger the mesh size you use, the more aggressive it's going to be with the type of preparations that it makes to the model. So let's just run this and we can take a look at what happens to the model. You'll see certain surfaces change color. Same thing with certain curves. And if we go take a look at some of these little regions where we had some bad elements, you'll notice it trims off some slivers. It'll merge those together with its neighbors. That's called a boundary surface. Little curves that might have short curves will be joined to their neighbors. So it now treats this to this as one continuous curve. Those are called composite curves. And then it's also going to do some suppressing. Just like mesh sizing did some suppression, geometry preparation will also suppress short edges or small curves, small slivers. All of these things that geometry preparation is doing, you can do on your own within the meshing toolbox. Here's those composite curves, those boundary surfaces, the feature suppression, but it's gonna do this automatically for you. So I almost always use geometry preparation on a solid and then I'll come back and manually tweak things if needed. So let's do the same 
So this little guy in here, I want to use a small mesh size on this. It does some prep on that. And just like Brian did, I have to do that third pass size on solid. I need to click both of these and I need to turn that off. I don't want to resize. I just want my adjacent matching. Now let's mesh and see what we get. <clears throat> okay. This is this is the fun stuff that everyone wants everyone wants to see some crashing, some failing. How do you manage this? So I want to look at two things. First, is our element quality better overall? And then what's up with this problem? You know, tet mesh was created, but problems were reported. Okay to update the selector with three nodes causing problems. Yes. So quick look here. This is uh, an example of some real painful tet meshing we had to do and geometry preparation was really the only way we would get it done. But here's, here's some steps um, that we're going through right now when you gotta try and improve your element quality. Like we said, take a look at the messages, keep your eye on that. Try geometry preparation, maybe do some splitting and always check your mesh quality. So first we'll do our mesh quality. We can see we're below 0.8 on the small solid. And we've got a few elements up there for the big solid. But it looks like the majority of the elements are higher quality now. We're also going with a bit larger mesh size, which can sometimes cause some bad, bad elements around tiny features. The other side of this is the fact that there was some sort of problem area it automatically updated the selector for us to help us find that area. And that is right here. So if we turn off the mesh, you can see we come down. I'll get rid of this transparency. I'll turn these back to opaque. We come down to this tiny little sliver right here. And geometry preparation said, oh, you don't want that sliver. So it clipped it off and merged it with its neighbor. And then when we go to actually mesh it, sort of collapses down there. So geometry preparation is being a little bit too helpful for us. And this is something that, you know, I see pretty commonly. And uh, <laughs> in our notes, we say there's no magic bullet, no perfect system. It means there's still jobs for us. We have to do the, uh, the hard thinking and, and fix up some of these areas. So all I'm going to do for this is just remove some of the features that geometry preparation created for us. Like I said, it's just doing boundary surfaces, curves, and feature suppression. So anything that it does, we can undo. So I'm gonna remove this little wedge from the boundary surface, see if we can get this little sliver back in here, or this little tapered section. And then what I have to do, you can see how this curve right here is just sort of a dotted line. That is a suppressed curve. That was with the messages we saw in the, uh, in the message window when we set our sizing. So let's do, we'll unsuppress that curve. <clears throat> now this is a little bit slow because every time I'm making one of these changes, it's remeshing the model for me. And there we go, we now have our original structure back. We haven't collapsed down that little corner. Now, obviously this is kind of a, a trivial little piece on our, on our overall model here, but you might run into the same issue in areas of, of concern for you. So that's, uh, that's kind of a way to chase down some of the problems that geometry preparation might create for you. So you can always go into the meshing toolbox and undo those. Okay, so moving on, we've got a couple of steps left in our, our analysis workflow. Let's just scroll up here. We've done our geometry, our materials and properties. We'll do boundary condition, um, sorry, mesh sizing and meshing. We'll do boundary conditions real quick, and then we'll be ready to analyze and post.
and we're getting pretty close to the end of our our timeline here so we might have to uh, pass over to Brian with with some results as far as applying my boundary conditions go I'm just going to use load on surface and this will allow me to pick specific surfaces maybe we want to do some sort of bearing load in here and when you're working with applying your boundary conditions to surfaces you get more options like we could have our load applied normal to a surface maybe we apply some load here same thing goes for constraints when we apply it to geometry let's say we pick a cylindrical face like this it gives us these special options radial growth rotation around axis so it identifies the geometry and really allows you to do some more complex constraint options rather than just fixing everything all right so <clears throat> rather than taking the time to go through and fix all these holes uh, we'll jump ahead a bit and the, the last thing that I want to really point out before we get into uh, post-processing is when you're running an analysis model that's mostly tetrahedrals like this, let's create our analysis manager. We're going to do a new static analysis. When it's mostly 10-node tetrahedrals, we want to use this elemental iterative solver. And you can actually significantly reduce your solve time. The other thing we do in our analysis manager, maybe we've got some bad elements in here, but we just want to force this thing to solve. We can turn off our geometry check or our element check, even though it says geom check. It's looking at the element quality and it's going to kill your analysis if it finds some bad ones. So sometimes I say, all right, first pass, ignore the bad elements. Let's just get it to run here. All right, so I'll do the uh, the cooking show swap here. Bring up a uh, a completed model. What's that? Oh, okay. Um, this model I went through and I ended up. Here's the load. Here's all my constraints. You can see the little symbols at each of those mounting holes. I ran this with the iterative solver. I think. It was actually pretty quick for a model quarter million nodes maybe took two or three minutes on my laptop now as far as post-processing goes there's the, the standard deform there's not a whole lot of deformation in this model so i have it scaled up a lot there's our contours you can choose to contour our stresses here we've got von mises stresses and you'll notice the colors here are a little bit different from the default because we've got um, our own custom view settings. But the most interesting, uh, <laughs> it's very useful but difficult, sometimes hard uh, for people to learn, is the free bodies, free body diagrams. So if you wanted to figure out exactly how much reaction load do I have on one of these mounting holes, Obviously, the sum of these reaction forces is just going to be equal and opposite to my load, but how does it get distributed to each of these? Is we can create a free body diagram. So, first thing you have to do is make sure they're turned on. You can see this model has some existing free body diagrams in it. We'll just get rid of all those and we'll create a new free body diagram. Now, this is another one of those topics where there's some dedicated seminars that spend a lot of time. But the, I think the best starting place for a free body diagram is just looking at your reaction forces. And what we want to do is an interface load. You'll see when you click on that, you get the ability to do a total force and a total moment rather than individual nodals. So I'm going to turn these off because I don't want to see you know, a hundred reaction loads at each individual node. I just want to sum all those up together. So that's sort of done. It's got the initial settings for me. And now I have to pick the nodes, the individual nodes that I want to use to generate my free body diagram. So I'll grab all of the nodes. I used method on surface. I'll grab all the nodes 
on these guys here, it's going to automatically create that free body diagram at the center there. And it's a little guy, but I could rescale this. Let's make this a little bit bigger. There it is. So there's our X, Y, and Z load at that particular fastener. So the example models that you guys will have access to on once we get them uploaded on the web, I went through on this particular model and created free bodies at each of those individual mounting holes. And I thought this was pretty interesting because you can scale those vectors by magnitude. Let me resize there and see, all right, these mounting holes way out here have very little load. The ones real close to our bearing load here get a lot more reaction force. And you can do a resolved vector. You can do components. You can set it up however you want. There's lots of view options here. But it's a great way to see the distribution of load throughout your model. All right, so worked our way through some post-processing. Um, running a little short on time. A few other nice things, more advanced features with FEMAP that I want to talk about, um, but we'll have to get into a bit more next time, is the API, you the application programming interface. A lot of the load application or analysis setup that we went through today can be automated via the programming interface. So if you go on to the AppliedCX.com website, in addition to resources like these seminars, there's also APIs that you can download. And like Andy mentioned earlier on, we've got API classes. So if you want to start writing your own, you can get spun up that way or download some existing ones and play with those. Yeah. Unmuted. Um, so when we use the iterative solver with linear context and the contexts do not converge, uh, results don't get loaded. Is there a way to force results to get loaded? Is when we use the direct? Mm. You know? No, no, I don't. If you don't have convergence with yeah, Nastran, yeah. you don't, you don't get you don't get results. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's yeah. It. Let's take a quick look. Most of the other questions got got answered. Yeah, there. I think so. I think I answered most of them uh, except for that one. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, well, thanks for your time, everyone. I know this was a a massive dump Muted. information crammed into an hour, so that's why we record these. You can come back later on, take a look at them, pause, rewind, slow down a bit. And if you think of any questions that come up after the seminar, feel free to email us. All right. Unmuted. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Have a good one, guys.